Hi there, and welcome to A Song of Ice and Fire Explained. Today we'll be summarising the entirety of Fire and Blood in preparation for the release of HBO's House of the Dragon. We'll also explain what we think is going on in each chapter. So, this book is written from the perspective of Archmaester Gildane of the Citadel in Old Town, and to be frank, he is clearly an unreliable historian with his own bias, and we'll be discussing the ways in which he distorts history. So, with that in mind, Chapter 1, Aegon's Conquest. Starts with Gildane explaining that the history of Westeros is largely determined by Aegon's conquest, and events from across the Narrow Sea. In Valyria, the Targaryens were one of about 40 Dragonlord families vying for power, until a mysterious event, known only as the Doom of Valyria, wiped out all of the Dragonlords. Aenar Targaryen moved his whole family to a faraway island, Dragonstone, 12 years before the Doom, when his daughter Daenys the Dreamer foresaw the destruction of Valyria. The furthest Valyrian outpost to the west, the Targaryen spent 100 years on the island before Aegon the Conqueror, born 27 BC, wed to both his sisters, Visenya and Rhaenys, sailed for the west. The three siblings each rode their own dragons to conquer Westeros, which was divided into seven warring kingdoms. After attempting to make a peaceful agreement with Arglac the Arrogant of the Durandun, Aegon and his sisters left forth a burst of ravens that travelled to all seven kingdoms in Westeros, proclaiming there was now only one king, Aegon the Conqueror, and the old kings could either bend the knee or be destroyed. He had his coronation at the mouth of the Blackwater River. With barely a few hundred men, Aegon and his sisters stormed Westeros with their dragons. The small folk cheered Aegon on, but the kings and their bannermen opposed him. The Westerosi armies were larger, but they were no match for three dragons. Harren the Black, the king of the Riverlands, refused to bend the knee to Aegon, thinking that the impenetrable castle he had spent his reign building, called Harrenhal, would shield him from dragons. He and his family were roasted inside. King Arglac the Arrogant heard what happened and decided he would not die the same way he met the Targaryen army in battle known as the Last Storm. The Storm King nearly won until Rhaenys swooped in with her dragon, Meraxxus, and Ori's Baratheon, Aegon's first Hand of the King and probable bastard brother, met Argalac in battle and killed him. Argalac's daughter, Argella, barricaded herself in their castle and said she and her men would die before surrendering, but her men opened the gates in the middle of the night and delivered their lady naked and chained to Ori's, who dressed her and told her of her father's death, then took his sigil as his own and asked Argelia to marry him. The two western kings, House Lannister and Gardiner, assembled the largest ever army and marched north. They outnumbered the Targaryens five to one, but the three dragons combined for the first time during the conquest and obliterated both armies in what would be known as the Field of Fire. House Gardiner's line was extinguished, and their stewards, House Tyrell, were given the reach as Wardens of the South. The Stark army marched south, but when they approached the Targaryen forces, King Torin bent the knee in order to protect his men from burning. Visenya rode her dragon into the Vale and convinced the Arryns to yield without a fight, but Rhaenys could not convince the Dornish Queen to do the same. Aegon took his forces to Old Town, the biggest city in Westeros and the center of the faith. The High Septon had fasted and prayed for seven days before telling Manfred Hightower, Lord of Old Town, to surrender or the city would burn. Aegon walked into the city and three days later, the High Septon anointed him King of the Seven Kingdoms, though Dawn had still not been conquered in the Starry Sept. The coronation was witnessed by many more people and so marks the official start of Aegon's rule although he had been calling himself a king for two years. Aegon declared that he would build himself a city on the three hills where he and his sisters first set on Westeros, King's Landing. Unlike the other books in A Song of Ice and Fire, this fictional account of the Targaryens reads like an actual history book. However, the history Gildane is presenting us with as the most accurate version of the truth is the trap Martin wants us to avoid making because we know the Citadel is rife with conspiracy and ulterior motives, as Lady Barbary Dustin and Marwyn would claim. 
Gildane's mock academic voice acts as though he is above personal bias or deceit, which means we should be all the more suspicious of what he chooses to tell us, or more importantly, what he chooses not to tell us, since choosing to tell history from one perspective neglects others and is within itself a form of bias. Sometimes a historian who doesn't hide his bias can be more trustworthy than one who knows how to conceal his lies with nuggets of truth. Lastly, Aegon's life is well documented as he is seen as the most important historical figure of his age. But the lives of his sisters who helped him conquer Westeros are largely obscured, as is the life of his bastard brother, Ores Baratheon, who was also instrumental in the conquering of Westeros. The small folk are left mostly silent, their stories untold by the historians of Old Town, even though their part in the battles between Aegon and the seven former kings of Westeros ultimately decided the outcome. Chapter 2, Reign of the Dragons. The first 13 years of Aegon the Conqueror's rule was marked with war and strife throughout Westeros. In the bite, the Sutherlands declared their lady a queen until Visenya arrived on her dragon. On the Iron Islands, several contenders vied to become king, including Lodos, who said he was son of the drowned god. When Aegon arrived on his dragon and conquered the islands, Lodos prayed for the Krakens to rise up and kill the dragons. When they did not, he walked into the sea with rocks in his pockets and thousands of his followers did the same. Aegon allowed the Ironborn to choose their own wardens and they selected Vicon Greyjoy, who swore fealty to Aegon. Dawn was the only kingdom that had not submitted to Aegon, so he and his sisters attacked the kingdom. Rhaenys burned Planky Town, but the town was on a river and almost everyone hid from the fire in the water. Lord Tyrell took an army to meet the Dornish in battle, but the Dornish refused to meet in battle. Instead, they retreated and led the Conqueror's army on a wild goose chase through the desert, poisoning the wells and crops along their way. Ori's Baratheon and his men were trapped in between rock slides, and everyone except Ori's and a few others who were kept for ransom by the widow lover of Will were killed. Aegon conquered a few empty castles full of women and children, and then met Rhaenys at Sunspear, which she had also taken. Since no one was there to fight, including the Princess of Dawn, Maria Martell, or the Yellow Toad, Aegon announced victory and installed his own men. However, as soon as he was back in King's Landing, the Dornish came out of hiding and overthrew all the Castellans, killing and torturing them. The war continued for years without much progress. In 7 AC, the Widow Lover ransomed Ori's back to King's Landing. When Aegon realized that he had cut off Ori's sword hand, he burnt wiles, but the Widow Lover hid in caves and tunnels beneath the mountains. In 10 AC, Rhaenys was leading an attack on Hellholt when a defender launched a scorpion that hit her dragon, Meraxxus, in the right eye. Meraxxus crushed the tower and died. No one knew whether Rhaenys died in the fall or beneath her dragon, or in prison years later. Aegon and Visenya spent the next two years scorching all of Dawn, paying ransoms to anyone who would kill a Dornish lord and escaping from several assassination attempts themselves. In 13 AC, Maria Martell died in her sleep. She was succeeded by her son, Nymor, who sent his own daughter, Daria, to King's Landing to broker peace. Aegon was about to refuse, but then Daria gave him a personal letter that changed his mind. He flew to Dawn and agreed to peace without surrender, and so the Dornish were victorious, and Aegon would rule Westeros for 24 more years without another war. Now, this chapter demonstrates Westeros is full of rampant sexism, even though some of the strongest leaders in the realm are women. Princess Miria Martell, an elderly woman, is the only one in the Seven Kingdoms who was able to defend her kingdom against the Targaryen invaders. But rather than appreciating the victory, the people of Westeros deride her strategies. Dornish courage became a mocking name for cowardice amongst the lords and knights of Aegon's kingdom. More would say, Maria fought like a woman, with lies and treachery and witchery. The Dornish victory was seen to be dishonorable. Here we see that no matter what sort of intelligent or impressive feats a woman can courts in Westeros, she will never garner the sort of widespread acclaim and idolization as Aegon. 
who massacres and burns people alive in their own homes. The First Dornish War lasted nine years and killed thousands. And it seems heavily implied and makes the most sense that the letter Aegon received from the Dornish to end the war was written in Rainey's handwriting. Ultimately, we will never know what was written in the letter, and thus the theme of ambiguity in history is well exemplified in Fire and Blood. Chapter 3. The Heads Had the Dragon. Governess under King Aegon I. After peace with Dawn was secured, Aegon began unifying the Seven Kingdoms into one realm. He and Visenya brokered marriages alliances between the Great Houses, fostered children at court, and spent half a year travelling to castles in order to socialise with the lords and ladies of Westeros. But he also set up court wherever he went so he could hear the small folk. Aegon travelled with six maesters to educate him on the customs and histories of the lands, and in order to make note of his decrees. Mostly he allowed the kingdoms to run as they had before, because he wanted to create peace. Before Aegon conquered Westeros, rarely a few months would pass without war breaking out. But Aegon and his dragons prevented this. Aegon allowed the small folk to take issues to their lords, and lords would do the same with him. He permitted the Faith and the High Septon to retain power, although he was not a religious man. Meanwhile, King's Landing grew to become the third largest city in the realm, after Old Town and Lannisport. While ruling, Aegon implemented the position of Archmaester and a small council to help him rule. Rhaenys fostered patronage for musicians and Visenya established the first King's Guard. Aegon ruled similar to Tywin, with a light hand during peace and a clenched fist during times of war. Despite there being no initial record of Aegon's personality, it could be argued that 15 years of war had converted Aegon into a bit of a pacifist. The first king spent half his life travelling Westeros, keeping tabs to make sure everyone was content and stamp out any chance of revolt. Aegon spent the other half of his life at court, creating a system that prompted harmony between the Seven Kingdoms and himself. However, this manifested in Aegon doing nothing to establish rules or laws that the lords and ladies of Westeros had to obey and permitted the existence of Lord's Right to the First Knight. Even though Aegon can be credited with reducing the small folk's chance of dying in war, he objectively did nothing to improve their social mobility or individual rights. Chapter 4. The Sons of the Dragon In 7 AC, Rhaenys gave birth to Aenys Targaryen, he was small and sickly. When she died in dawn, the boy and Aegon were distraught. In 12 AC, Visenya gave birth to Maegor, who was strong and healthy. In Valyria, incest and plural marriages were the norm, but in Westeros, both were forbidden by the faith. Aegon had no daughters, so his sons married outside their bloodline. Aenys to his cousin, Alyssa Valerion, the daughter of Aegon's master of ships in 22 AC. When they gave birth to Rihanna, Queen Visenya suggested the infant be betrothed to Maegor, but the parents and the High Septons objected. So Maegor married Cerise Hightower in 25 AC at the suggestion of the High Septon. Over the next few years, Aenys and Alyssa had four more children, three boys and a girl, but Maegor and Ceres did not have any despite their efforts. In 37 AC, Aegon died of a stroke with his grandchildren on Dragonstone. Aenys was crowned king. And when Maegar knelt to him, Aenys pulled him up and said they would rule together. But Visenya and others at court said Aenys was too weak to be king and only Maegar should rule. Amidst the change, several rebellions roared up in the Vale, the Iron Islands, and Dawn. Aenys did not react strongly but Maegar took his father's dragon and squashed the rebellion in the Vale, hanging all the traitors, even the lords. Ori's Baratheon led an army to Dawn and devastated their army, taking captive the son of the widow lover, Lord Walter Will, and cutting off his hands and feet. Ori's died on the return from his injuries, but is said to have died happy. When the rebellions had all been stopped, Aenys hailed his brother, a hero, and named him Hand of the King. They ruled together for two years, but when Aenys had another daughter, Mega announced Cerise was barren and took another wife, Alice Haraway, in an illegal ceremony performed on Dragonstone by Visenya without the consent of Aenys. 
all the lords of the realm and the High Septon condemned the marriage. And Aenys gave Maegor an ultimatum, end the second marriage or be exiled for five years. Maegor went into exile with his new wife. When the Red Keep, which his father had started building, was nearing completion, Aenys announced that his eldest two children, Rhianna and Aegon II, would wed one another. The High Septon denounced this, and Visenya told Aenys that he needed to either call off the wedding or burn down the Starry Sept. Aenys did neither, and during the wedding, he announced that Aegon would be Prince of Dragonstone, which had been Maegor's official title, and this greatly upset Visenya. Aenys sent the newlyweds on a tour of the kingdom, but they were jeered by the faithful. The Septon who performed the marriage was killed in the streets by the poor fellows, and two of them snuck into the Red Keep and tried to kill Aenys, who was saved by his king's guard. Aenys moved to Dragonstone as a holy war broke out across the realm. Rhianna and Aegon II were trapped in a Craighole castle. The warrior's son, the Faith's militia, took over King's Landing. Aenys weakened and became ill, then died while under Visenya's care. Queen Alicia and her children fled to her father's castle. Visenya flew east on her dragon and returned with Maegor, who named himself King, and killed the maester who objected. Maegor flew to King's Landing and challenged the warrior's sons to meet him, seven against seven, in battle, so that the god could decide who was just. Maegor won, but suffered injuries that left him unconscious for 27 days. His second wife, Elise, Elise arrived from the east with a woman named Tyanna of the Tower, a woman from Pentos who was rumored to be Maegor's concubine or Alice's consort, and to have supernatural powers. Visenya dismissed the maesters and gave over care of Maegor to Tyanna. And the next morning, the king awoke and flew to King's Landing, where he burnt 700 of the warrior's sons at prayer in their sept. Then Maegor led a series of attacks on the poor fellow's faithful extremists. Maegor won the battles on the back of his dragon, and then went back to King's Landing and married Tyanna. Visenya convinced Elysia to come back to King's Landing with her children. Rhianna and Aegon II fled to Castle Rock, and Rhianna gave birth to twin girls that the High Septon called abominations. Rhianna begged her husband to take her and their children east, but he refused. Maegor demanded that all his enemies come to King's Landing to swear fealty and bring him a hostage, and that the High Septon himself needed to come and stand trial for treason. When they refused, Maegor and Visenya burnt down their castles, then turned to Old Town to attack the High Septon. But before they arrived, he died. Accounts differ on the cause, but when Maegor arrived, the gates were open and the Targaryen banners were flying. 90-year-old Septon Pater was named High Septon, and he disbanded the poor fellows and the warrior's sons. Maegor remained in Old Town for six months, reconciling with his first wife and holding trials for the traitors, while Rhianna and Aegon II snuck back into King's Landings, stole their dragons, and returned to Pink Maiden Castle, where they assembled an army. During the first battle, Aegon II rode his dragon, Quicksilver, in battle against Maegor on Beleriand who descended on the smaller dragon and ripped his wing off, sending both falling to the ground. Maegor returned to the Red Keep and set about creating an heir, but none of his three wives got pregnant, until Elise finally did. But Elise miscarried, and the child was deformed as a monster. Maegor executed all of the scepters and the midwife, and then Tyanna told him that Elise had feared infertility, so her father, the Hand of the King, had sent over 20 men to her bedroom. Maegor tortured the men until they confessed, then killed Elise, her entire family, and all the men. When he returned from Harrenhal after killing off the last of her relatives, he found that his mother had died and Alyssa had fled with her two youngest children. Maegor had the third, Viserys, tortured until he died. When the Red Keep was finished, Maegor killed all the workers so that its secrets would never escape. His first wife, Cerise, died suddenly, and Maegar decided to take three new wives, two widows, one whom he had widowed in order to wed, and his niece, Rhianna, whom he summoned back. He named her eldest daughter his heir. Both widows got pregnant, 
but both delivered monstrous stillborns. Under torture, Tiana confessed to poisoning the children, and he locked her in the dungeons, but the realm said Magor was cursed. Alicia returned with Alisane and Jaehaerys, who proclaimed himself king. Lords flocked to him and abandoned Magor, including Rhianna, and her eldest daughter. Magor met with his counsellors in order to determine a plan. When he sent them away, he was alive, and his king's guard were at the door. When his wife, Eleanor, came into the throne room in the morning, she found his body impaled by the swords of the Iron Throne. Now, did Magor save House Targaryen and preserve the conquest undertaken by his father when compared to his brother? Kind of. When Aenys failed to act on two separate occasions, Magor rode to the defence of House Targaryen and had to wage two devastating wars while his brother and nephew failed to do anything. Visenya might have killed Aenys since she considered him too weak. And not of her line. Which is why polygamy is unsuited in feudal succession since both wives would want their son to be king. Our next video will actually be on how the maesters distorted history to portray Magor as completely cruel while concealing all trace of the High Tower and Citadel's role in the Faith Uprising. Even Gildane writes Aenys and his family as the heroes, while Magor and Visenya are painted as villains. Even though it can be argued, Magor spent most of his life trying to protect his brother and obeyed Aenys' exile. Without question. Chapter 5. Prince Ontu King The ascension of Jaehaerys I After Magor's death, Jaehaerys I rose to be king in 48 AC and ruled for the next 55 years. He was only 14 when he was first coronated, so his mother, Alyssa, acted as queen regent and she and her council ruled in his stead. But even at a young age, he was invested in his realm and his rule. The first order of business involved seeing to all of Magor's supporters. They were imprisoned and the council considered putting them all to death without trial. But Jaehaerys wanted the people to see he was not his uncle. He allowed all but the worst traitors who had tortured and killed Viserys at Magor's order to go free, so long as they swore fealty to him sent a ward and gave up lands and honours. Although the Holy Wars had officially ended, there was still discontent in the realm. A man who styled himself Septon Moon garnered a large following and called for the true Septon to denounce the Targaryens. He was assassinated by a woman who came to his tent under the rouse of seducing him. Once he was dead, his followers dispersed and Jaehaerys traveled to the Starry Sept in Old Town to be coronated. A week-long celebration ensued, and so Joffrey Doggett, the Red Dog of the Hills and the leader of the outlawed Warrior's Sons, attended and asked that the Warrior's Sons and Poor Fellows be reinstated. Jaehaerys refused the request, but asked the Red Dog to join his King's Guard, and he agreed. Jaehaerys and his party returned to King's Landing, but Rhianna took off on her dragon for Fair Isle. She left her twin daughters, Arya and Riala, behind. Arya was the heir and lived at court. She had always been quiet and shy, but her sister, Riala, who was studying to be a scepter at Old Town, was a loud and adventurous girl. After the coronation, their personalities seemed to switch, and many suspect their mother had swapped them. Now, Magor and Jaehaerys are often portrayed as the worst and best of the Targaryen kings, as the difference between good and evil. But this binary way of retelling history is suspicious and instead really tell you who was actually good or evil, but instead who the historian thinks was good and evil. We'll have another video on why Gildian portrays certain characters as good and not others. 6. The Year of the Three Brides 49 AC is remembered as a peaceful and prosperous year and is referred to as the Year of the Three Brides. Rihanna Targaryen married 17-year-old Andrew Farman, the second son of the Lord of Fair Isle, without asking permission. Her mother and Rogar Baratheon, Hand of the King, were furious, but Jaehaerys and Alysanne were delighted. Soon after, Rogar Baratheon and the Queen Regent Alicia announced that they were going to be married. Jaehaerys questioned Rogar's motives, but did not speak against the marriage. The gold wedding was the largest the realm had ever seen, 
and lords from all over came to see the new king and his sister, Alisane, who impressed everyone when they flew in on their dragons. After the wedding, a week of festivities ensued in which a tournament was held to fill the remaining five spots of Jaehaerys' Kingsguard. After the wedding, Alicia and the council began to search for a match for Jaehaerys in secret. They agreed only that he could not marry his sister, so they decided to marry her to Rogar's youngest brother. Somehow, Alisane found out about the plans and told her brother Jaehaerys, who took her to Dragonstone and married her in a ceremony with his king guard standing witness. Though the marriage was not consummated, when Rogar and Alyssa arrived, Rogar ordered his men to separate the siblings, but the king's guard threatened to protect the king and queen with their lives. Alicia ordered peace and silence from all, and returned with Rogar to King's Landing, while the newlyweds stayed in Dragonstone. Fire and Blood reads like a Wikipedia history with a constant rotation of characters entering and leaving the story as we follow the events surrounding the crown. However, you can forget that certain characters have been there from the start, but in the background. Take, for example, Alyssa Valerian, who experienced most of the events of the book as both a spectator and participant, having married Aenys, given him six children, watched his reign crumble, and Magor seize power, heard her son die in battle against his uncle, her other son Viserys was tortured to death by Magor, her eldest daughter forced into marrying her uncle, and watched her youngest son take the throne. So, when Alysanne and Jaehaerys marry on Dragonstone in a secret ceremony, she is terrified for their safety, having experienced so much pain and suffering. However, the realm does not rise up against them, which we'll get into why in the next chapter. Chapter 7, A Surfeit of Rulers After his secret marriage, Jaehaerys remained on Dragonstone, silently training and waiting to come of age with his queen. Alicia and Rogar both hoped to end the marriage before it was consummated and made public. So Alicia devised to send Alisane a group of servants, scepters, and ladies who would hopefully teach her and Jaehaerys that incest was immoral. Rogar installed a spy and seducer within the group, Corianne Wilde, a teenage girl who would later go on to write a book about her wild days before becoming a scepter. In the book, Corianne says that a man, either Rogar or his brother, the texts differ, sent for her, inspected her body, and bid her to seduce the king and report back to him. Meanwhile, on Fair Isle, Rihanna had married Andro, who was 17, and feminine. But rumour had it that Rihanna was in love with his sister, Alyssa Farman. When Andro's father died and his brother became lord, he kicked Rihanna out and tried to keep Alyssa from following her to Castle Rock, but failed. Meanwhile, legend has it that Corianne might have slept with Jaehaerys, but whether she did or not, it did not affect his union with Alysanne. A series of lords and ladies visited the island to garner favour with the king, and rumour of his marriage with Alysanne began to spread. Rogar suggested that Jaehaerys was too selfish to be king, and said that they ought to send him away and install Arya Targaryen in his place. Alyssa wept and then took away his title as Hand of the King and sent him home. Alicia gave the post to her brother and from then on left ruling to him. Rogar sent his brother to Old Town to fetch Riala Targaryen, but the scepter on duty called the guards rather than the girl, and they locked him up and told the crown of the traitorous plot. Rogar Baratheon is probably the first nuanced portrayal of a character in Fire and Blood as both a caricature of good and evil. The text gives time to detail his inner complexities and the possible motivations for why he did the things he did. It is noticeable that, in history, we know more about the sex lives and rumoured debauchery of rulers than we do of the small folk. Chapter 8, A Time of Testing, The Realm Remade Jaehaerys returned to King's Landing as a true king on his dragon. Straight away, he set to work with his council allowing some of his mother's choices to remain in place, but getting rid of others. When he had thoroughly cleaned out the castle, emptying the cells of prisoners his uncle had wrongly imprisoned, he called Rogar Baratheon to him. Rogar assumed he would be sent to the wall at best and executed at worst, but Jaehaerys pardoned his treasons and asked him to return to his service 
under the condition that he act chivalrously towards Alicia. And Alisane. With tears in his eyes, Rogar agreed. The king then went on to install Rego Draz, a foreigner from Pentos who had become one of the richest men in the world, on his own. The kingdom was in debt, so Draz took out three loans from the Iron Bank of Bravos and its rivals in Mia and Tyrosh. Then Jaharis did away with all previous taxes and placed them on luxury items and castle repair. Next, the king sent for his queen and they had a proper wedding, complete with an official bedding and consummation, in hopes of making their marriage more palatable for the realm. Jaharis sent forth seven preachers to tell the realm of Elisane's goodness and love for the king and the realm. The endeavor worked and the holy did not rise up against the king. Rihanna came to court and told Jaharis she wanted Dragonstone as her own. He said she could use it as a gift, but it would be his in name still. She asked for her daughter, Aria, as well, and he agreed. In this chapter, the complete lack of reaction from the realm at Jaharis' marriage is extremely suspicious, and the fact Gildane barely pays this any mind is highly suspicious. However, Finding proof of the maester's treachery is extremely difficult when they're the only ones writing the history books. Chapter 9. Birth, Death, and Betrayal under King Jaehaerys I Jaehaerys spent more of his reign on the road than at home, almost always travelling with his queen and their two dragons. He travelled with a smaller retinue than Aegon had, and spent less time at each castle so he could see more of his people and be less of a burden on them. During his first journey, he brought Alisane with him and she was attacked by a group of religious scepters in Maidenpool, while bathing in a spring where only women were allowed. Her ladies protected her and she and her unborn child escaped unharmed. Afterwards, Jaehaerys asked Jonquil Dark, a female warrior, to be the queen's sworn shield. Alisane's child was born early and died, but Alicia and Rogar gave birth to a healthy son, Boromund, on Dragonstone. Arya and her mother, Rihanna, were unhappy with their lot, especially when Alisane gave birth to a healthy girl, Daenerys, and pushed Arya down the line of succession. The year 54 AC went down in history as the year of the stranger because of all the troubles starting with the death of the court's beloved Septon. On Dragonstone, Rihanna's lover, Alyssa, missed home and wanted ships to sail east, but Rihanna said she would prefer her to stay Alicia left, stealing three dragon eggs to sell for ships. In Old Town, the High Septon died and the most devout met to select a new one. Jaehaerys and Alisane travelled to Old Town to arrange for a Septon who would uphold the doctrine of ex- which legitimised sibling marriages between Targaryens. On their way home, word arrived that Alicia was dying in childbirth. When they arrived, Rogar ordered the Septors to save the child. Rihanna arrived too late to make amends with her mother and threatened Rogar with Dragonfire if he should ever wed again. When Rihanna went back to Dragonstone, a sickness broke out, killing the maester and all of the young women on the island. Rego Draz told Jaehaerys it was not a sickness but the tears of Lys, a poison from the east. Rihanna realised her disgruntled husband had done it in retaliation for her neglect of him, but before she could arrest him, he jumped from a tower, killing himself. While Jaehaerys was about looking for a new hand of the king to replace Daemon Valyrion, Alysanne went to Dragonstone to comfort Rihanna. Arya begged to return to King's Landing, but Rihanna forbid it. After Alysanne returned home, Rihanna appeared on her dragon to tell them that Arya had stolen Valyrion and flown away. Chapter 10. Jaehaerys and Alysanne. Their triumphs and tragedies. With no news of Arya, or the dragon eggs, Jaehaerys dedicated himself to organising and reforming all of the realm's laws. He set off on another journey across the realm as Alysanne went to Dragonstone and gave birth to a boy, Aemon. In King's Landing, construction on the gigantic dragon pit finally finished, and the monarchy held a great tournament there. Alicia Farman changed her name to Alice Westhill and took her boat around Westeros to Old Town to find a crew to take her where only few had gone before, into the mythical sunset land she had dreamt of sailing since a girl. The Targaryens 
hear about her intent, but by the time they arrived to capture her, she had sailed away and they could not find her. In 58 AC, Aria returns on Beleriand, ragged and gravely ill. She died days later under the care of Venifer and Septon Barth, who said publicly that she died of a fever. But Barth's written accounts differ. In it, he writes that he suspects Beleriand, born on Beleria, took Aria back to the doomed city as inside the girl were writhing monstrous worm-type creatures that burnt her from the inside out and died when put on ice. Jaehaerys banned travel to Valyria under penalty of death later that year. Rhianna devastated, where she remained alone until her death. Alysanne gave birth to another son, Balon, and he and Aemon became close as siblings. Can be. Septon Barth was made the new hand of the king, and he travelled to Bravos to talk to the Sea Lord of Bravos, who they suspected had bought the dragon eggs from Alyssa. The Sea Lord arranged for all the debt of Westeros to be forgiven by the Iron Bank so long as he got to keep the eggs, which had hardened into rocks. Jaehaerys used the money to improve the city of King's Landing. Alysanne travelled to the north and won the hearts of the Starks of Winterfell and the men of the Night's Watch while waiting for Jaehaerys, who was attempting to negotiate a peace between Pentos and Tyrosh, but the aftermath proved unsuccessful. At the wall, Alysanne went to Molestown and held her woman's court with the whores and women who lived there. She heard tales of horror about the tradition of the first night, in which lords were able to take the maidenhead of the bride and argued that the practice be abolished. Septon Barth agreed with her and Jaehaerys assented. Alysanne consistently advocates for women's rights in Westeros and Jaehaerys helps her in many of her undertakings but she is ultimately much more progressive than the realm is, and much more progressive than Jaehaerys is willing to force the realm into being. Although the two have a loving and blissful union, they are at odds several times during their reign, often when it comes to the rights of women. When their first daughter, Daenerys, is born, Alysanne delights that the young, charming, intelligent girl will rule as queen herself one day, but when her second son, Aemon, is born, Jaehaerys refers to the boy as his heir, which displeases Alysanne. Daenerys is older. She is first in line. She should be queen. Rather than arguing with his wife, Jaehaerys would simply respond that their daughter would be a queen when she married Aemon, the future king. And they would rule together just as their parents did. This skirts the issue and allows Jaehaerys to placate his wife without making any changes in the laws to allow for women to inherit equal to men. Again, when Alysanne hears the tales of low-born girls who have experienced the horrors of the first night in which they are ripped away from their new husbands to be raped by their lords, although Jaehaerys agrees with her that it is distasteful, he doesn't want to risk the lords who might resent a privilege being taken away from them. The horrors of the practice do not matter as much to him as keeping peace in the realm, and so he is intent on keeping them in place until Septon Barth takes Alysanne's case and argues on her side. Here we see why the maesters write fondly of Jaehaerys, who always tried to uphold the previous institutions and systems that the maesters helped build and maintain throughout Westeros. Chapter 11, The Long Reign, Jaehaerys and Alysanne, Policy, Progeny, and Pain In 59 AC, one of the ships travelling west with Elisa Farman returned and said they had parted ways with her a year ago. She was never heard from again. But years later, Corlys Valerion swore he spotted her ship at port in Ashai. Winter arrived and a deadly plague from somewhere overseas called the Shivers broke out, killing thousands of high-born and low-born people in Westeros. Chaos broke out in King's Landing as all the guards were sick, and Rego Draz was beaten to death in the streets for being a Pentoshi. Jaehaerys rode into town himself and found the men responsible, then hung and disemboweled them. Daenerys Targaryen and many others died before the plague ran its course. Jaehaerys installed new members of his council and staff. Alysanne gave birth to Alicia less than a year later, 
and a few years later, Miguel joined the family, then Vagon. Dahlia, Sarah, and Vizera. With Daenerys dead, the Targaryens named Aemon heir and wed him to Jocelyn Baratheon. After sending Miguel to take vows as a scepter, Alysanne gave birth to Gaemon, her 11th, who died a few days later, as did Rhianna Targaryen, alone in Harrenhal. Sir Lucamore Strong of the Kingsguard was found to have taken three wives and sent to the Night's Watch. Aemon and Jocelyn gave birth to Rhaenys, and soon after Balon married his sister Alyssa and birthed Viserys, Vagon was sent to the Citadel to study. Alysanne gave birth to Gael in 80 AC. The queen loved arranging marriages for lords and ladies, but was baffled when it came to her children. Dela was anxious and frightened of everything and rejected all suitors. Jaehaerys said that she had to pick someone by the end of the year, and so she wed Roderick Arryn, a friend of the family. She died in childbirth, and Alysanne blamed Jaehaerys. A few years later, Alicia and Balon had their third child. She and the child died. Alysanne and Jaehaerys got into another disagreement when their daughter, Sierra, came of age. A wild and disobedient child, she grew into a rebellious teenager. She and her two ladies were discovered to have slept with three of her suitors. She was unrepentant and tried to steal a dragon, so her father sent her to join the Silent Sisters. She escaped and ran away to a whorehouse in Lys. Next, Elisane matched Viseria with Lord Theomor Manderley, a stout middle-aged man who built a greater alliance between the Targaryens and the North. Viseria tried to argue her way out of the marriage and seduce her widowed brother Balon, but to no avail. The night before she was to be shipped off, she switched clothes with her maid and went out on the town with friends, only to get in an accident that broke her neck. Distraught, Elisane asked Jaehaerys to leave to retrieve Sierra from Lys, but he refused her, and she began to resent him, sending him on a tour of the kingdom by himself. Rhaenys married Corlys Valerion and got pregnant. Her father, Aemon, went to Tarth to deal with a Myrish conflict that had moved overseas, and was killed by a poisoned arrow shot by an assassin at Lord Cameron. Princess Gael ran away with a singer. When she gave birth to a stillborn child, she killed herself in the sea. Alysanne, grief-stricken, died on Dragonstone in 100 AC. Jaehaerys and Alysanne's early reign was one of love and forgiveness by choosing to marry each other, pardoning those who supported Magar's rule. However, Alysanne, and specifically Jaehaerys' treatment of his daughters, is insidious through the lens of a modern reader, but completely normalized by Westeros standards. Of his seven daughters, only two survive, which are Miguel, who was sent to Old Town to become a scepter, and Sierra, who ran away from Jaehaerys to become a prostitute in Lys. Jaehaerys is harsh with his daughters, projecting a Madonna-whore dichotomy on them depending if they obey or not. He forces them all into marriages whether they want to or not, and this results in the death of all his daughters, bar Daenerys who dies from the plague, before she is old enough to marry. Alyssa is happy in her marriage to her brother, but dies from pregnancy. Della is deeply frightened of marriage, but is forced into it by her father, and she also dies in childbirth. Gael runs away with a singer and gets pregnant with a bastard that dies during childbirth. But rather than return to her family, whom she knows will be unforgiving, she drowns herself. Vizera is forced against her will into marriage with an unappealing middle-aged man in order to secure an alliance with the North, but dies on the night before she is to leave to meet him in a reckless accident. Despite all the tragedy, Jaehaerys and Alysanne, who are progressive and kind in the way they rule the kingdom, continue to treat their daughters like property, expecting them to remain chaste and marry who they are told to. When a girl rebels, as Sierra does, she is treated with absolute disgust and hatred by her father, who does not listen when Alysanne pleads for reconciliation. But the only people Jaehaerys was ever able to forgive were men he feared. When a woman goes out of bounds and steps into territory she is not allowed, it is perceived as unforgivable, 
despite the rigorous criteria imposed upon a woman's reputation. Sierra is the only girl to achieve financial independence for herself, but other than prostitution, how else is a woman meant to do this? Chapter 12, Heirs of the Dragon, A Question of Succession. After Amon died in battle, Jaehaerys named his brother, Balon, successor, rather than his daughter, Rhaenys, by Jocelyn. But in 101 AC, Balon's stomach burst open during a hunting trip. In order to determine the line of succession, Jaehaerys determined to hold a great council at Harrenhal in order to decide on the next ruler. The council discarded bastards and females and came down to Viserys, who was the son of Balon, the second son of Jaehaerys, Targaryen, and his sister, Alyssa Targaryen, over Rhaenys Targaryen, the daughter of Aemon Targaryen, the first son of Jaehaerys, and her son, Lainor. With Corlys Valerion, the sea snake, the council decided on Viserys. In a landslide that seemed to suggest succession would never pass through a female, even if she had male heirs to follow her. In 103 AC, Jaehaerys died and Viserys ascended to the Iron Throne. Viserys was 26 and had married Aima, who gave birth to a daughter, Rhaenyra. Viserys made his wild younger brother, Daemon, or soon to be known as the Rogue Prince, command of the City Watch. Though Daemon wanted to be heir to the throne, when Aima died, giving birth to a boy who also died, and Viserys discovered Daemon had been in a tavern making jokes about it, he officially named Rhaenyra his heir. Daemon left to Dragonstone with his whore, Mycera, and got her pregnant, then gave her a dragon's egg. Viserys told Daemon to take the egg away and go home to the Vale with his wife or be labelled a traitor, and Daemon agreed, sending Mycera back to Lys. The baby died on the journey in childbirth. Viserys remarried Alyssian Hightower as she produced several sons, but Viserys did not change his heir. Daemon went to sea with Corlys Valerion, won victories against pirates and styled himself King of the Narrow Sea. He appeared at court on his dragon and gave Viserys his crown. The brothers laughed and Viserys remained at court the next six months. Rhaenyra was delighted to see her uncle and the two spent much time together. Something transpired between the two that history does not know. But six months later, Viserys sent his brother away and started looking for a husband for Rhaenyra. Lenor Valyrian, who preferred men, was chosen against her wishes. A tension existed between Rhaenyra and Alicent. Rhaenyra's longtime companion and personal knight, Kristen Cole, left her side and took a place beside Alicent. Rhaenyra replaced him with Sir Harwin Strong when her husband went off to his castle, Driftmark. Rhaenyra gave birth to Jaehaerys, who looked like Harwin at almost the same time Alicent delivered Darion. Daemon's wife died in an accident and he married Lena Valerian, daughter of Corlys Valerion. Lyanna had twin girls and then a boy, who died along with her. Next, Rhaenys' husband, Lainor, was stabbed by his friend, Sir Carl Corrie. At Lainor's funeral on Driftwood, the tension between Alicent's boys and Rhaenyra's boys came to a head when three of Rhaenyra's boys got into a fight with Alicent Hightower's son, Aemon Targaryen. When he called them bastards, they sliced his eye out. King Viserys ordered everyone to make up and threatened to pull the tongue out of anyone who called the heirs bastards again. He sent Rhaenyra back to Dragonstone and Harwin to Harrenhal, where he died in a fire. Rhaenyra married her uncle Daemon in a secret ceremony on Dragonstone and quickly had a child, Aegon, who looked like a true Targaryen. In 127 AC, after a near-death experience, the king held a feast in which all the children came and made peace with one another. But rumour has it that once the king went to sleep, the children fought. In 129 AC, King Viserys died in his sleep. Jaehaerys was a wise king and the first to introduce the seeds of democracy into the monarchy, rather than deciding upon his heir based on his own personal preference or his own loyalty to his wife or children. Jaehaerys ordered a great council with all the great and lesser lords of Westeros and agrees to abide by the council's decision, whomever they choose. Here, we see what is perhaps Jaehaerys' most radical act as king. Having ruled for over 50 years, he realises that it's not important how he feels or what he thinks. He stays away from the great council and lets all the people of Westeros work out 
who they want for a king on their own. When they bring him their choice, he abides happily with it and seems not to give it another thought. However, as with almost everything that happens in history, it can be easily argued that Jaehaerys was not the least bit democratic and knew exactly who the great council would select to replace him, Viserys. Passing the decision onto others allowed Jaehaerys the ability to avoid the responsibility of defying his wife, who wished to see her daughter, Rhaenys, be queen. Alysanne made clear her views on women's rights many times throughout their reign. And although Jaehaerys often placated his wife, his first instinct was never to act in a way that might empower women. And the lenience towards, miso towards misogynistic culture ultimately leads to the dance of the dragons and the eventual destruction of his house. Chapter 13, The Dying of the Dragons, The Blacks and the Greens. The period between 129 and 131 in which the two rival branches of House Targaryen fought for power is known as the Dance of the Dragons. The moment King Viserys died, Alicent met with a small council to determine how to proceed. The only person who disagreed with their plot to place her son Aegon II, Aegon the Elder, as king was Lyman Beesbury, the master of coin, who was promptly killed by Kristen Cole, the kingmaker. The conspirators kept the news secret for a week as they made preparations for the coming feud, and then Aegon was crowned in the dragon pit. When news reached Rhaenyra on Dragonstone, she went into labour and gave birth to a stillborn girl. Afterwards, she assembled her own council. She was woefully outdone in almost every category, but Alicent only had four fighting age dragons, and Rhaenyra had twelve. One of her counsellors suggested that she burn King's Landing, but she and her husband Daemon did not want to engage the dragons in battle. They decided to take Harrenhal first and sent out the princes Jaehaerys and Lucaries on dragons to rally allies to their cause. Rhaenyra held a coronation and when King's Landing heard the news, Grand Maester Aurel was sent to offer generous terms to Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra refused and Aegon was furious. Now, the Dance of the Dragons is yet another example of the bloodshed and infighting that is inevitable within a monarchy, wherein power is intended to pass down through bloodlines, and does not take into account the individual's personality or the will of the people. Over and over again, siblings and cousins and bastards feel desirous of the power of the kingship, in a way that suggests greed is a part of human nature. But the history shows that Greed is not the only problem with the monarchy system. Aegon, at first, refuses his mother's wish that he take the crown from Rhaenyra, his half-sister. But when he is told that he and his siblings would be executed if Rhaenyra took the throne, it was this, and only this, that persuaded Aegon to accept the crown that the small council was offering him. If this is true, Aegon acts out of fear in order to protect his family, rather than a lust for power showcasing that even those who do not lust for power must play the Game of Thrones. Chapter 14 The Dying of the Dragons A Son for a Son Daemon went to Harrenhal on his dragon and captured the castle, along with a serving wench named Alice Rivers, who some said had magical powers. Jacarys went to the Vale and convinced Lady Jane Arryn to join by promising her protection from dragon riders. Then he flew to White Harbor and convinced Desmond Manderley by offering his younger brother to wed Desmond's daughter. Then he flew to Winterfell and became friends with Craigon Stark. They betrothed their future children together and then signed a pact. Meanwhile, Lucaris rode to Storm's End to ask Boris Baratheon to join him. But Aemon Targaryen was there, promising to wed one of Boris's daughters. Boris denied Lucaris, and as Lucaris was leaving, Aemon who had lost his eye to Lucaris, followed him on his dragon, then killed Lucaris and his dragon. When Daemon found out, he hired a rat catcher and a guard from the city's watch to sneak in through the tunnels to the Tower of the Hand where Helena was known to bring her children every night before bed. The two men, blood and cheese, hid in Alicent's chambers, bound and gagged Alicent and murdered her bedmaid. There, they awaited Helena's arrival. After killing her guardsmen and barring the door, they took Helena and her children hostage, and forced Helena to choose which one of her sons would die. Helena offered herself, but was refused, threatening to have blood rape Jahira and to kill all three of her children 
should she refuse. The two men forced Helena to choose. In the end, Helena reluctantly named her youngest child Prince Maylor, who was deemed to be too young to understand what was happening. In response, the two men killed Prince Jaehaerys instead, cutting off his head with a sword and fled with his head in hand. Chapter 15 The Dying of the Dragons The Red Dragon and the Gold Rhaenyra's supporters doubled as Aegon II's supporters diminished. The king started drinking heavily and then named Sir Criston Cole Hand of the King, who organised a series of attacks that began with Rook's rest in the Crownlands to lure out Rhaenyra. But instead, her mother-in-law, Rhaenys, who was overlooked in the Great Council of 101 by Jaehaerys, arrived on her dragon. Aegon and Aemond surprised her with their dragons. Rhaenys knew she was dead, so she tried to take out King Aegon II, and even though he survived, he was so badly burnt that he remained in bed for the rest of the year and his dragon could no longer fly. Aemon took over as protector of the realm. The green faction only had two dragons remaining, and so the black faction began looking for Targaryen bastards to ride the riderless dragons of Dragonstone so they could attack King's Landing. Before they got the chance, the Triarchy attacked and killed, captured, Prince Viserys, who was being transported to Pentos for safekeeping. The queen was despondent after losing her child, so she stayed at Dragonstone in mourning where she had been for months while Jacares sent five dragons to the fleet. Jacares and his dragon went down, enraging the queen. Aemon concocted a plan to attack his uncle at Harrenhal, but Daemon learned of the attack from his spies weeks prior, and he and the queen attacked King's Landing, which was not protected by dragons. With the help of Daemon's friends in the city, they conquered the capital in just a day. Alicent and Helinia were taken captive, but Aegon II had fled the castle with Laris Strong, which unfortunately meant that the war would continue nonetheless. Chapter 16, The Dying of the Dragons, Rhaenyra Triumphant. Aemond took Harrenhal and felt victorious until he heard what happened in King's Landing. Aemond and Kristen Cole split up, with Aemond taking Vagar to burn Black Alliance settlements and Sir Criston Cole set off to wage battle by land on his behalf. To refill the treasury, which had been emptied, Rhaenyra imposed a series of harsh taxes. She had her enemies killed, and people began to think of her as a female Maegor. Aegon II's youngest son, Maelor, was discovered at an inn and killed along with his sworn knight. Aemond retaliated by attacking the realm with his dragon. Sir Criston met a host of Northmen in the battlefield and tried to surrender to them but they refused and shot him with arrows. Aemon's younger brother, Darion, had an army moving across the south. About 10,000 of Rhaenyra's bannermen were assembled at Tumbletown, with two dragons flown by the Sir Ulf White and Sir Hugh Hammer bastards with Targaryen blood who had become dragon riders on Dragonstone. When the king's men approached, they switched allegiance and burnt the town. Daemon and a bastard girl named Nettles who had become a dragon rider, hunted for Aemond and Vagar together, but to no avail. Rhaenyra began to suspect all the Targaryen bastard dragon riders of treachery, and tries to have them all imprisoned. When she found out Daemon and Nettles were having an affair, she ordered the girl executed, but Daemon helped her escape, then went to Harrenhal to wait for Aemond. Aemond arrived on Vagar, and the two exchanged these final words, You have lived too long, uncle. Daemon replied, on that much, we agree. The two fought. Both dragons and Aemon's body were found dead, but Daemon's was not. When Kristen Cole found himself outnumbered, he begged the Northmen to let him surrender in order to save his people. When this was refused, Cole offers to fight them right then and there, three against one. The Northmen shoots him with arrows that kill him immediately, denying him a hero's death. I'll have no songs about how brave you died. Kingmaker. There's tens of thousands dead on your account. Chapter 17 The Dying of the Dragons, Rhaenyra Overthrown. Rhaenyra's situation in King's Landing grew worse when Helena, wife of Aegon II, killed herself by jumping out of her tower. Rumor spread that Rhaenyra had killed her half sister, and after the tales of the deaths of young Jaehaerys and Maelor, the city rioted. A religious prophet named the Shepherd who had been preaching Targaryen doom for months, excited the masses and opened the gates. 
of the city, and the shepherd instructed his followers to kill the Targaryen dragons in the dragon pit. Prince Joffrey begged his mother to let him go to his dragon, but Rhaenyra refused. He stole her dragon, but it was resistant to a new rider, and Joffrey fell to his death before reaching the dragon pit. The mob killed all three dragons in the pit. Rhaenyra's dragon came back to the fight and died in battle, leaving King's Landing empty of dragons. Rhaenyra and her remaining son fled. For the next month, the shepherd and two Targaryen bastards styled themselves kings and chaos reigned. Back in Tumbleton, White and Hammer had both their dragons on hand but would not go to King's Landing until they were promised Harrenhal and the crown, respectively. Prince Daron and his men planned to kill Hammer, but then a bastard dragon rider, Adam Valerion, came into the camp wishing to restore his name after Rhaenyra had called all bastards traitors. The three dragons all perished in the ensuing battle, as did Darion, Hammer, and Adam. With one dragon left, White was the only rider left, and he wanted the crown, but was poisoned. Rhaenyra and her son went back to Dragonstone, which had been taken by the long-missing king, Aegon II. His men had infiltrated the castle, but when they went to seize Bella Targaryen, Daemon's daughter, she escaped on her dragon, which just so happened to meet Aegon on his dragon. They fought, but they all survived, though all were injured. Rhaenyra walked into the castle unaware that her brother was there. He took her son away and fed her to his dragon in 130 AC. Chapter 18, The Dying of the Dragons. The short, sad reign of Aegon II. Aegon II remained on Dragonstone as he plotted how best to return to King's Landing. His dragon died and he nearly had Bela killed, but decided he would use her to get the Valyrians who had control of the sea on his side. Meanwhile, Boris Baratheon heard of Rhaenyra's death and went to King's Landing and restored order with Alicent in the name of Aegon. Since Aegon could not get back without peace from the Valerians, they conspired to agree to Corlys Valerian's terms to get his help and then kill him later. Aegon returned to King's Landing still unable to walk and executed the three pretenders. Instead of forgiving his enemies, he executed them. At first, he refused to allow his daughter to marry Rhaenyra's son, Aegon III, and name them his heirs, which would have united the two halves of the family. But when the Master of Whisperers, Larry Strong the Clubfoot, urged him to agree to a betrothal now and call off the wedding later, he agreed. But the forces of the realm descended on his army in the Crownlands and crushed the Greens' last army. Plotters inside the castle, led by Larry Strong himself, killed 20 of the most essential king's men. In 131 AC, Aegon was found poisoned. His daughter Jahera was wed to Rhaenyra and Daemon's son Aegon III. Chapter 19 Aftermath The Hour of the Wolf at first, the realm seemed ready to accept peace under the new reign of 10-year-old Aegon III and his bride, Jahira. But then the Northmen, led by Craigon Stark, arrived at court. They said the war was not over yet because not all the great lords had surrendered, and Castle Rock and Old Town still held half the realm's gold. Plus, Storm's End still had Jahira and could easily crown her queen if they chose. The Northmen arrested Corlys Valerion because they suspected him of poisoning the king, which they considered a heinous action. Castle Rock and Old Town surrendered themselves and their gold, and Storm's End sent Jahira. The Northmen ran out of enemies. Craigon Stark was made Hand of the King, and he tasked himself with discovering who was responsible for the poisoning. He held a trial and found over 30 people complicit in the conspiracy. All chose to go to the wall rather than be beheaded aside from Larry Strong and Sir Giles Belgrave, a member of the Kingsguard, who believed he should have protected his king better and so deserved to be executed. Much of Fire and Blood is centered around the south of Westeros, and the north gets largely ignored. Most of the men who had marched south with Lord Cregan Stark did not expect to see their homes again. Victory was secondary to the men of these winter armies. They marched for glory, adventure, plunder, and most of all, a worthy end. Here we see that the Northerners have an entirely different way of viewing their lives than the Southerners, who, after two bloody years of battle, want to see an end to the fighting and no longer cares which Targaryen sits the Iron Throne. However, the Northmen do not want to return home and become a burden onto their families in the coming winter. 
So what they seek is to die fighting for a righteous cause in Rhaenyra. Chapter 20, Under the Regents, The Hooded Hand. The Northerners left the capital and thousands flocked in to witness the royal wedding and coronation. Next, the king named his small council, installing both sides of the loyalists in equal numbers. A council of regency was then formed, featuring seven lords and ladies from the realm, in order to help run the kingdom. Sir Tylan Lannister, who had been horrifically tortured and had facial scars, was named Hand of the King. Queen Dowager Alicent refused to abide with the compromise and was confined to her rooms. Grand Maester Oral bribed his way out of being shipped to the wall and was found working in a brothel. Tylan, fond of the Maester, sentenced him to be held in the tower where he was allowed to write his confessions. Baylor and Raina, Damon's daughters by Lena, were the presumed heirs to the king and his young queen, though the council was wary of attempting to name another woman an heir. Bela was wild and disobedient, so the council decided she should marry a man 40 years older than her. She refused and then ran away to marry her cousin, Alan Valerion, in a secret ceremony. The council allowed Raina to help select her husband, and she married Corwin Cobry. Despite all the marriages, the realm suffered from attacks from the Ironborn and plagues, and the winter in the north led to famine, because so many men had been lost in the Dance of the Dragons. Many widows were in power of great houses. Harrenhal had been abandoned to robbers and bandits, but when the king's men arrived to clear the castle, they found Aemon's mistress, Alice Rivers, and his bastard son, who she said was the true king. Maester Oral was released as plague moved into King's Landing, killing Alicent and the hand of the king, Tylin Lannister. Throughout the history, cycles of war and peace continue, but the peaceful recovery after the Dance of the Dragons lasts much longer than it did after King Maegor, since there is no Jaehaerys to bind the realm back together, and with almost all the dragons dead and the surviving Targaryens deeply traumatized, it is said of the young king and queen, both of them are broken. These are not normal children. They have no joy in them. They neither laugh nor play. The girl wets her bed at night and weeps inconsolably when she is corrected. Because the young king and queen, 10 and 8 respectively, witnessed so much of the horrors of war firsthand, the queen had been in the room when the rat catcher killed her brother and the king had been in the room when his uncle fed his mother to his dragon. They, like the realm, have been irreparably traumatized and the only winners from the dance are the maesters of the citadel. Chapter 21, Under the Regents. War and peace and cattle shows. After Tylan Lannister's demise, the young king at just 13 made a series of new appointments. But Unwin Peak, one of the seven regents, undid his choices and instead selected his own men and appointed himself the king's hand and protector of the realm. Unwin was a cruel and harsh hand treating the king and queen like hostages and executing many prisoners in spectacles. While the city was in his grasp, the rest of the realm was still being assaulted by famines and attacks from the Ironborn, and the sea was congested with a battle the free cities were waging against one another. Unwin sent Baylor's husband, Alan Valerion, to sea, and he fought an entire fleet without permission and won the hearts of the small folk, who saw him as a hero. In retaliation, Unwin asked Aelin to defeat the Ironborn, a near impossible task. Reyna, daughter of Daemon, had a miscarriage, and Bela announced she was pregnant. Queen Jehera fell out of her window just as her mother had, either jumping or murdered by Unwin, whose bastard brother was the king's guard at her door during the time. A week later, Unwin announced that the king would marry his daughter Myrell, but this enraged all the lords of Westeros. Unwin declared that a bowl should be held instead, wherein the king could choose for himself. Unwin hoped to rig the bowl in his favor by having his daughter seduce the king before the bowl and eliminating her rivals. But Reyna and Bela arrived with their ward, the orphaned niece of Alan Valerion. Daenerya and the king chose her. Daenerya and the king would wed that year in 133 AC. Chapter 22, Under the Regents, The Voyage of Alan Oakenfist. Alan Valerion started his voyage to conquer the roving bands of Ironborn from the Iron Islands who had been pillaging the western shores of Westeros. From Fair Isle for years, 
He made peace with the flamboyant Tairoshi Ricolio Rindun, who was styling himself King of the Narrow Sea, and then made peace with the Dornish. By the time he arrived at Fair Isle, however, one of Dalton Greyjoy's wives, a lowborn girl, stolen from the shores of Westeros, had slit his throat in his sleep. The small folk had rebelled, and the Ironborn had returned home. Alan returned home, but while stopping in Dawn, a messenger told him that the Prince Viserys Targaryen, who all had thought dead during the Dance of Dragons, was alive in Lys and married to his captive daughter, Lara Rhaegar. Alan sailed to Lys and retrieved Viserys, paying a huge sum and promising to keep the marriage in place. Aegon III was elated to have his brother back, save for Unwin, who resigned as Hand of the King, leaving all his men in place at court. Chapter 23, and the end of Regency. The court celebrated the return of Viserys, but had no love for his wife and her foreign ways and gods, or her family, which they accused of being overly ambitious. Her father, a bank owner named Lysandro, became first magister for life in Lys, and her uncle, Drazenki, married the Dornish princes and became lord of the step zones. Rhaenys' dragon, Morning, grew big enough to ride and flew it to Dragonstone where they stayed. Viserys and Lara welcomed their first child, Aegon IV. Bela and Alan welcomed their daughter, Lena. They placed an egg in her cradle, but the dragon hatched male formed and bit the girl. Aegon III's only friend, cupbearer and food taster, died of a poison assassination, leaving Aegon distraught. Lysandro and Drazenki both died on the same day under suspicious circumstances that suggested an assassination plot. Lysandro's son, Lazaro, took over the bank, but then embezzled all the money within, ruining half the city. He ran away and the rest of his siblings were put on trial. All their property was taken away and their children were sold into slavery. Lazaro was found and whipped to death. In King's Landing, Unwin's men arrested Lara's brothers and the hand of the king, Thaddeus Rowan. Aegon and his brother locked themselves in the Red Keep, refusing to hand over Lara. When Thaddeus proved innocent, a conspiracy to rid the city of Lara and her family was uncovered. A new council of regents and small council was installed, and Torin Manderley of the north was installed as Hand of the King. Lara's brothers were mildly punished for their possible connection to the embezzlement. Torin Manderley ruled the realm well. He and the council planned a year-long journey for the king to undertake once he turned 16. On the morning of his 16th birthday though, Aegon III walked into the council room and told Torin he was sitting in his seat. He dismissed them all from his service and said there would be no journey. Torin left for the north, angry and embittered by his treatment, and strangely, this is the actual endpoint of Fire and Blood, which leaves off with the ascension of Aegon III in a most inconclusive manner. Obviously, this is part one and only comprises the first 136 years of Targaryen rule. But like real history, Things aren't neatly resolved as we'd like them to be. Anyway, that's it for Fire and Blood Explained. If you enjoyed watching, please consider subscribing and check our video series on every chapter and book of A Song of Ice and Fire Explained. Also, when you get the chance, try out Fantasy Flights, a Game of Thrones board game, Digital Edition.